economy is done, mostly because it may teach you something that you didn't know before. Maybe that'll be useful, maybe it won't, but it's just interesting to know. And I think the same is true when it comes to SETI, when you're looking for you know, proof that somebody else inhabits the universe. I mean, what's the practical application of that? It's a little unclear, but um, unless you can get in touch and understand one another and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's a good point. I never thought of like once we find it, it's like, well, okay, well, now what? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people would want to, you know, call them back. But and, and I'm sure that would happen no matter what anybody thinks should happen. That will happen. But the thing is, if they're, you know, 100 light years away, I mean, who knows how far away, far away they are, but they're going to be at least, you know, four or five light years away. But let's say uh, 100 light years away. All right, so you get on the horn and you say, hey, uh, good to Good to hear you guys. Uh, we're the Earthlings, and we'd just love hmm. to interest you in subscribing to our magazine or whatever. <laughs> and it takes 100 years for that message to get to them and then another 100 years for their response to get back to you, which might be no thanks. I mean, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> really slow communication. Now, is there is has there been a time where, where you've picked up something where you're like, where you've gotten really excited and it turned out to be something else, but was there ever like a specific time where you can remember where you're like, I think I may have got like, this is the one, or do you approach everyone kind of skeptical where you're like, well, we'll wait and see. Well, to begin with, most of this is done automatically these days. So you're not even aware of what's happening. The uh, software only notifies you if it's, you know, found something that seems to stand up to the kind of automated tests that you make to determine whether the signal's really coming from space. But there have been, I mean, particularly in the old days, let's say 20 years ago, when things were a little less automated, where we would pick up a signal and it, for a while, would look like it was the real deal. I mean, it passed all the original tests, but then the computers just keep applying tests. And, you know, I remember one signal, we got modestly excited about it, but then 15 minutes later, uh, it went away because the test proved that it was just terrestrial interference. So that was a disappointment. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, so I was going to bring it back to that. We had Avi Loeb on here um, a couple of years ago, and he was talking about Oumuamua and how perhaps it was some type of either defunct or AI, alien tech. What are your thoughts on, because you said like if an AI, yeah, gives, it gives, or a civilization gives rides to, to its successor, and that successor might be AI and it can build it attaches to asteroids and it builds ships in space and it sends them all over the galaxy for whatever reason. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, they might do that. I mean, Avi Loeb, I, I, you know, if, if, he, if he didn't have tenure at Harvard, you know, a lot of these ideas that he has <laughs> probably wouldn't, you know, be getting as much play as they do. But Avi Loeb has established his credentials long ago. Uh, I think he was chair of the astronomy department at Harvard for five years or something. Mm -hmm. He's a bright guy. But he also, you know, he has a, a weakness for ideas that a lot of other people just sort of roll their eyeballs at, but maybe they're wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that Avi Loeb has the, uh, he, he has the reputation that allows him to follow up on things that other scientists would get beaten up for. Right. right. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's, it's a good thing. I don't know about Oumuamua. We won't know until we find another Oumuamua. And uh, there is some suggestion that we already have. There's something called, 2i Borisov that was found by the Russians, uh, which is also another rock that seems to not be from our solar system, but from somebody else's solar system. So if that's the case, uh, then, okay, Oumuamua was probably just a rock. But we don't know that for sure yet. And so it's it's worthwhile, you know, paying attention uh, to these things. I mean, maybe it's an alien ship. And if only you could get a close-up photo of Oumuamua you know, you would see a bunch of portholes along the side and little green faces behind them. I mean, <laughs> the, the the picture that everybody has of a muamua was this artist's impression, uh, which looks like a rock. But on the other hand, we never had a photo of a muamua that showed it to be any more than a single pixel of light, you know, just a, a little <laughs> dot. So nobody knows what it looks like up close. So you're saying what you're saying is all those pictures were fake news. It could have been a spaceship. They were artists' impressions. Now, the artists would probably not like you to say they're fake news, but indeed they were not. They were not made by cameras that were anywhere close to Muamua. I think the closest Muamua got to us was like uh, two hundred million miles or something like that, far away. Yeah, I yeah, and I I think I just, we just read an article not too long ago. We were talking about it on the show where they they've 
cre- they think they've recreated the means of its propulsion when it left the solar system. Something to do with uh, helium, um, hydrogen. I, I, hydrogen. I, I can't remember because I don't. It's been a while since I read the article, but they they pretty had a pretty good idea of how it accelerated now. So that not to say they know for sure. They said they'll never know for sure because they didn't have the test. They're just it was just a hypothesis. Uh, but why on the topic the of on the topic of aliens, how do you what do you what are your thoughts on, um, you know, the United States government um, coming out with obviously the gimbal, the Tic Tac, the Baghdad Phantom that we keep seeing on UFO Twitter and all that stuff? What are your thoughts to those kind of uh, releases? Yeah, well, <laughs> of course, those are aliens. As, if they are aliens, I actually don't think they are. But if they were, those are aliens that had taken the time, the trouble and the expense to come to Earth and, you know, uh, mostly seem to be interested in teasing uh, our Navy's top guns by flying around in their airspace. I I don't know if that would justify the expense for any alien society to send these guys here to Earth. But the thing about the the three videos, right, the TikTok and so forth, is that you can come up with explanations for all three of them that don't involve alien craft at all or anything very exotic, right? Right. Uh, the, the the peanut, for example, you know, the peanut, it looks like a black peanut, actually, Yeah. in the video there. Well, you can understand that because these, these videos were all made with infrared gun sight cameras on F-18 uh, fighter jets, I think. And so, you know, these, these cameras are aimed forward. Their, their purpose is to alert the pilot that there's something in front of them that they have to worry about, not to find aliens. But hmm. consider that there's a, just a commercial jet in front of the pilot, maybe 50 or 100 miles away. These things could still see that, right? If that jet in front of them is sort of flying away from them. So they're looking up the tailpipes of that jet. And, you know, the jet has two uh, engines, say, or even four, but but with two, you know, you just see two black dots. And if it's far enough away, then you don't have all that much resolution and the two dots kind of merge a a bit. And you get a a peanut-looking thing in the sky there and all it is is some other airplane right well that's true for all these videos you can you can come up with very prosaic explanations for what you're seeing and none of these require alien visitation yeah we're 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 weather balloon guys we usually we usually chalk them up to weather balloons weather balloons yeah weather balloons have have a bad rep (laughs) (laughs) well they shot three of them down because they were so dangerous (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, I guess, yeah, Um, as you said, yeah, it could be an easy explanation like that, or you could even go, some of them seem to, like, travel much faster than a human should be able to withstand, like, the force of the the propulsion in the turn. So it could be some type of, it could could be terrestrial, like, advanced drone technology, just like back in the the early 90s when the Blackbird was a myth, and all of a sudden they they released it finally. Yeah, Yeah. we have this supersonic plane, and yeah, you probably might have seen it taking off, and that was the UFO. Yeah, but a lot of the argument, keep in mind, a lot of these arguments are based on the fact that, well, I mean, this thing was going Mach 4 or something like that. It was was going much faster than anything that we have. (laughs) But how do you know what speed it was going at? All you know is the angular speed across the sky. And to convert that to the real speed in miles per hour, miles per second, whatever, you need to know how far away it is. Right. And, and you don't have that information for a lot of these videos. You don't know how far away it is because you don't know what it is. So you, you, when people say, oh, it was moving at 5,000 miles an hour, I mean, that's that's somebody's guess based on nothing. Based on what they, how far they thought it was away. I mean, yeah. Can't tell me, you can't tell me it's wrong when they say it. <laughs> like, uh, it could well, be. Have you, have you published this too, Dan? I mean, <laughs> 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 I was like, yeah, yeah. When it's like you don't, when you don't know, you're missing some kind of information like that. They can pretty much make any statement they want, and then nobody can really challenge it because it's like, well, you, you know, we're missing that piece of information. And it's like, eh. so it's like, mm. <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of argument from authority uh, in this biz where if somebody has some sort of technical background or is in the military and so forth, then they're believed by a lot of people simply because of, you know their job. Uh, the other argument is an argument from ignorance when they say, well, we don't know what it was, but, you know, it's obviously moving at, uh, you know, 10,000 miles per, per hour or something like that. 
And, you know, the, the people who read that don't know how you compute the speed. So that becomes an argument from ignorance for them. They, they believe these people are in authority. They must know. Yeah, those are my favorite type of arguments. Yeah. <laughs> I, I read the headline and that's as far as I go. I'm like, good enough for me. Mach 8. Yep. He eyeballed least. it. He squinted with one eye. That's good enough for me. He's flown the jet. <laughs> He's I think that's <laughs> Right. I think that's yeah. one of the um that's one that's actually one of the things I highlighted. It's like in your book, and it was like debate is entertaining, but exploration and experiment are definitive. So I was like that kind of I think that kind of yeah. line. That was good. Um but it's yeah, so the the exploration and, and gathering of data is just like to know, which I think is just you know, one of their seems like one of our qualities of just humans. Like we're curious and we want to know what's out there whether or not like you said it's applicable or practical or whatever it's just like we kind of just want to know about what's going on around us and uh you know help us understand the world better um and to that i was kind of um i don't know if you if you're familiar with the news like they i just saw this article today and i guess i would ask your thoughts about it um about the how you know nasa was like slashing their budget or they they released their budget and they they cut off the what was the veritas uh the veritas mission was a planned mission to venus after they had that big um the big discovery or you know the, the, the a lot of scientists were kind of pushing for the idea that that they've detected folk like active volcanoes or volcanism on venus and that this mission was going to be pretty integral into being you know taking the taking the measure of that and there's a lot of disappointment or do you have any thoughts on that or well i didn't even know this was a case i was at a nasa event actually on friday so two days ago and nobody mentioned it then but uh i, I think that what you're referring to was the claim and it's about a year ago or so that there mm -hmm. was phosphine in the atmosphere yeah, of venus mm -hmm. and that would be very interesting because uh phosphine can be made by bacteria right so it could mean there's life on venus which is you know a bit of a surprise if true because the daytime temperatures on the surface of Venus are like 800 degrees or something. But balmy 800. You, huh? Balmy 800. It's a dry <laughs> heat, though, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I don't know if that's Fahrenheit or centigrade, but it really, at 800, it doesn't matter too much. I, but the thing, the, the point was that once you go up 20 or 30 miles into the atmosphere, which for Venus is a very thick atmosphere, it's 100 times thicker than here on Earth, then the temperatures are the same as in the room here. Right. So it may be that, uh, you know, what you were seeing were floating bacteria at the uh, higher altitudes in Venus's atmosphere, which would be really interesting. But I think that the, the whole thing is very questionable because calling it phosphine was based on um, looking for what are called absorption lines, the spectral absorption lines in the light coming off Venus. And the way they found that was involved some, uh, if you will, mathematical manipulation of the data, which to me, anyhow, seemed very suspect. So I don't know that they've established that there's anything in the atmosphere that's biological at all. But, you know, uh, sending more hardware to Venus seems, seems like a good idea to me. The problem is, of course, any hardware you send, uh, send to Venus usually melts shortly mm. after getting there. Yeah. So that's a problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you I have think a I've very seen thin so, yeah. window to send stuff back. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen some interesting concepts about when what possibly you know you could have the um my favorite was have basically like you said they have the you know very thick atmosphere you could basically have like an an airship and you know a balloon kind of platform just kind of sit and float you know conceptually. Oh, cloud city yeah yeah, yeah sit on top of there style. yeah you would drop the off it'd, it'd be like a research station but set on top of the clouds always kind of like that idea I thought that was pretty neat <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah and if you have uh, a failed engine engine it's catastrophic for oh, yeah. everyone aboard. So, Dan was saying something about NASA's funding getting cut. Where does SETI get its funding from? Well, and SETI a... these days does not get money from NASA, really. It doesn't, uh, at least not for our SETI experiments. Uh, but we, we could, that was killed, by the way, by a congressman back in 1993. He killed the NASA SETI program. What? Yeah, uh, yeah he did. Well, come if on. you live in the state of Nevada, uh, don't reelect this guy. But in, <laughs> in any case, <laughs> uh, SETI now gets its money for doing SETI from you know private donations it's it's oh, just wow. private money yeah. so it, i imagine like it must be hard then for funding i'd imagine well it is difficult it is difficult now uh, as it turns out a, a fellow here uh by the name of yuri milner he's actually russian but he lives 
you know, part-time in Moscow and part-time here in the Silicon Valley where I am. Anyhow, he, he was very interested in SETI, um, and uh, he's funded the Breakthrough Listen program, which is a SETI program mostly run out of the University of California at Berkeley. But he, he funds them, and he funds them with enough money that they can actually do very good experiments. Awesome. Legend. So if, where can, where can just, I'm just curious, where can members of the public or people listening, if they wanted to donate to SETI, where do they go? Well, uh, it's, it's up to them, but they, they should just look on the web um, for SETI programs, obviously at the SETI Institute where I am, you know, just go to the SETI Institute's website. I think it's just SETI.org. Uh, but the Berkeley guys are, you know, you could look them at the University of California at Berkeley uh, their projects are, you know, everybody has a website, so it's not very hard to find. And uh, usually these organizations don't protest too loudly if you want to give them some money. I don't yeah, think I anyone protests yeah. too, yeah. <laughs> too much. Nah, I don't want it. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I know there's SETI, and I, w I was actually surprised to learn, I guess it was a couple months ago, we were actually, I think we were talking about... Um, uh, I think we were talking about alien invasions or, you know, a prospect of that happening, but we were talking about there's the other associate that's not, they're not associated directly with SETI, but there's the other one. And we kind of talked about sending signals. There's the other organization. I can't remember. Something Eddie. Medi. That's it. Yeah. That's the one. Messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. So, like, for them, like, how, how, how well do you know them? Like, are, like, what is their, What's well, last I knew, there was <laughs> many had one employer, sorry, one employee, oh. uh, who coincidentally also happened to be the head of Medi. Uh, Whoa. That's <laughs> so this is the big value brand of SETI, basically. Yeah. Well, that, but that that's uh, transmitting. So that's a different project. But uh, it's, the, the name of the guy is Douglas Vakoch. He lives here in the San Francisco Bay Area. He had an office up at uh, in the city, up in San Francisco, actually. Um, I don't know if he's kept the office or not, since there's only one person involved, he may just work from home now. I don't know. But in any case, what he tries to do is get time on radio telescopes that have a transmitter, telescopes that can not only, you know, listen, but can also broadcast and then send messages into space uh, to in the direction of nearby stars uh, that are like the sun in general. And he's done that at least once. Um, I think it was in 2017, but in any case, so he can, you know, he constructs some messages. I think for Doug, uh, the most interesting part of Medi is constructing the message. You know, what are you going to say to the aliens? Gosh, yeah. What do you say? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, he says pictures. He just, you know, the, the history here is, I mean, there've been a lot of messages to aliens that have been sent mostly on spacecraft, right? You know, you all remember the pioneer plaque with the nudie mm -hmm. cutie couple and big dance, so and <laughs> golden discs. Yeah. And, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and there was also the, the uh, Voyager records had messages as well. And music, you know, well, let's send them some Beethoven, but let's send also some Beatles or whatever. So, yeah. you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of people have been interested in this message construction. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, <laughs> I mean, that, those messages to this globular cluster that were sent, I don't know, decades ago now, I mean, they're still going to take thousands of years to get there. And then there's another couple of thousand years for their response, if there is a response and the aliens get to us. So I think that the most interesting um, efforts in this field are to message to close by stars. And some of that is being done by METI. But on the other hand, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it, you've got to have patience because it might take a couple of dozen years before you can even expect to get a reply. Whereas with SETI, when you're just looking for a message, you're just looking for a signal, you, know, you might find that in the next hour, right? I mean, you don't have to wait for anything. That's yeah, it could point. be eavesdropping between two slow, <laughs> two planets already messaging each other, just yeah, intercepting that signal. Could happen. Middleman. That's so uh, if you were, I, I'm just saying, if you were on the other side, if you're on the Medi, like what, what would you put in your message? Like what, what do you think would be like the most, uh, like, I, I guess, like how would you encapsulate human culture like in, <laughs> into a message, like something? Yeah. Well, as I say, you know, what's been done is simply to sort of mimic what was done with the Voyager uh, 
the pioneer plaques and the Voyager mm -hmm. records and, you know, just show them pictures of us or how many of us there are and stuff like that. But personally, what I would send is I would just send the Internet. I would just code up the Internet and send it all because uh, anything they want to know, you can probably find on the Internet. And uh, there'd be a lot of redundant material and there'd probably be some pornography. But I, I can't imagine <laughs> that the aliens would care much about the pornography. So, it, uh, you know, I would just send as much material as you could. They'd be right. like, why is this 90% pornography? Like, there's, surely there's <laughs> more interesting all. stuff. Well, yeah, I wouldn't even worry about that. I mean, what's pornography to us is, you know, yeah. not pornography to my dog. I mean, you yeah. know, <laughs> let alone the aliens. I don't think. I mean, would it just be like that. the National Geographic Channel to them anyways? Yeah, they'd be like, oh, this is interesting. What's going on here? No, uh, that's how they do it. So, Seth, what's uh, what's your I, – I wanted to ask. I had this written down. What's your – do you have a favorite, like, alien – in movie or an alien movie well my favorite sci-fi films tend to be the ones that i saw when i was a kid because you know they made a much bigger impression on me and i remember seeing war of the worlds the the 1954 one whatever was the mm. year i don't remember and i was a kid but my god that really scared me i i couldn't sleep all night i couldn't sleep for a week uh so i, I guess those are my favorite but i mean i i i go to all them or as many of them as I can in these sci-fi films because I always like to see what other people think might be, you know, the experience of meeting the aliens or going to an alien planet. I mean, even the, the alien series of movies, the first one in particular, right? When yeah. they, you find this guy. I mean, that was really, really interesting. And it was a, a different kind of take on the aliens too, which I, I thought was kind of nice. So, but I don't know that I have a favorite. I like them all. I thought you were going to say contact. No, I was, I was, yeah, I was a, con I was a consultant for contact actually. So I, I had something to do with, you know, what they put in there, but um, it was good. But, uh, you know, I, I, I was kind of disappointed that the aliens looked like uh, Ellie Arroway's dad. Yeah. I mean, I thought that that was a cop out. I, I want to see real aliens. <laughs> I guess most. I think that's the, yeah, I think that's the, everybody's like. I say, like, oh man, oh my form would be too disturbing to you before you would not yes. be able to comprehend my entire <laughs> being and essence. Like, and it would exactly. Well, we don't. We up. don't. We don't make statements like that before wandering to the around the zoo. You know, <laughs> sure. you, you animals are in for a big show. horror show. <laughs> ah! I just a never-ending horror show of yeah. <clears throat> human filth <clears throat> coming through. <laughs> I'm sure the fish look at us and from the aquarium just like ah oh, just utter Scream. disgust yeah it's, it's, uh, yeah I, I always thought that too i was like you know what i think i can i'm i'm an adult i can handle it show me <laughs> yeah. now seth just before i'll be I... the judge of what i can handle well I mean, in, in some of the sci-fi films that were made in the 50s and 60s occasionally the aliens would look like I, there was one what was it it came from outer space i think was the name of the film and uh, the aliens look like us, but at some point, one of the humans says, you know, it's really remarkable. You guys look just like us, which, of course, saves on, you know, the cost of making a film. But, yeah. and he said, but, saves on is that, but is that what you really look like? And the alien says, no. And it's just a mask we put on that, you know, and, and so the humans said, well, can we see what you really look like? And they remove the mask, and it looks like, you know, something made out of, you know, 10 old vacuum cleaners, I mean, with hoses and so <laughs> stuff like that. It was really horrifying. <laughs> it was really horrifying. That was worthwhile. And the rest of the film wasn't very good, but that part was really good. So you said you consulted on Contact. Have you, been, have you consulted in, on any other of these sci-fi movies? A couple. Yeah, a couple. Yeah, they call up, and what they really want to know is, something that is, solves a particular problem that they're having, you know. Okay, so we've got these, uh, you know, astronauts uh, in this spacecraft, and then it goes behind the moon, and for 20 minutes we can't, you know, communicate with them because they're blocked by the moon, and, uh, you know, so consequently something attacks them when we can't see and that sort of thing. What could happen to them, you know, that kind of thing? Or um, is it, usually it's just, you know, technical detail they want to know well what would it be like if that kind of thing 
No, it's, it's I cool. feel like it's SETI the, is the perfect example of the beginning of every alien movie where you have all those scientists sitting in a room and then they pick up some sort of signal on some type of radar and they freak out and grab a phone and call somebody. Well, that does happen a lot. Usually they just see something on a, an oscilloscope. I, I don't think we even own an oscilloscope anymore. But, you know, an oscilloscope, suddenly you see this spiky thing. And then, of course, you have the audio that tells you that this is an alien thing because it's, you know, some some sound you've never heard before. Even in the movie Contact, which was fairly accurate, uh, you know, you hear this thing that sounds like a pile driver hitting a pot of whales, right? <laughs> and, and that was much better than the visuals. Just this <laughs> terrible sound. Awesome. Now, Seth, just before we let you go, um, you're going to be at, speaking at Contact in the Desert. <clears throat> I am, so it seems, yes. I've never gone to one of those, so... I don't so know people are, people like are look, looking to check Seth out live. That's where he's going to be. Was that June live. 2nd to 4th? Um, but if people want to find you, if they're not going to make contact in the desert, where, do you have a YouTube channel or where would people go to find more of your interviews or, or, your, or your work? Well, I don't, I don't uh, really in, endorse that idea for anybody. I mean, why would they want <laughs> that? But no, I mean, obviously they can go to the SETI Institute's website and find me. We also have a weekly science radio show. Big picture science. You can get that it's online. It's good. And, uh, and that's more, that, that shows more than, more than just about SETI. It's about science and oh, yeah. Yeah, astronomy in general. Science. Well, not even just astronomy. It's science and just in general. any cool science. Forefront smart of science. People talk about smart things. And it's good. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. We, we tend to interview a couple of people in every show about something. I mean, maybe it's artificial intelligence or maybe it's something else, but whatever. Awesome thing, Seth. I just had one. I just had one quick question before you go because I, I bought an uh, an artifact off Facebook Marketplace. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted it says "Do not open," so I just wanted to know your thoughts. I was told oh. this is a hundred percent a recovered alien being. Yeah, uh, I've got, got on... one of those in our office, but it looks a little different. Yeah, it's you notice that the aliens are just the right size to fit into the biggest uh, jar you can buy inexpensively. <laughs> yeah. Well, it says do jar. not open on top of mine. So I just wasn't sure if you have one too. Can we just agree that there, this is proof right here? I guess so. You can buy a lot of those things in Roswell, by the way, if you go there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the problem with the one we had was that the water eventually corroded the alien. The alien turned into rubbery <laughs> rubbery crud at the bottom of the jar. It does. T there, I did get a note that said, Give it a shake every once in a while. So maybe that has something to, something to do with getting some of that gunk off there. Yeah. But uh, I just thought I'd share that uh, I may have uh, proof of alien life right here. So. Well, just keep it on your desk. The, the disturbing thing is if in the morning you come in and you find that the jar is still there, but the alien is gone, you know, I, oh, I, I worry about that. <laughs> You'll be the first person I call. Yeah. <laughs> Seth! <laughs> awesome. Hey, Hey, thanks very much. We appreciate the time. I know you're a busy man, so that's a one-hour interview. We really appreciate it, and we hope to uh, be the first show you contact when you find the first guaranteed a alien signal. Well, I'll try and you keep call that us in first. mind. I, I, I promised some other show I would do that, too, so I don't, I don't know if I'll remember, but okay. Just, send a, just CC us on the email, and we'll, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll piggyback it. No worries. <laughs> All right, and uh, Seth, just stick around for a second. We'll show you. We'll tell you how to upload, finish the upload of your audio, uh, and for the rest of you, as we always say at the end of these things, keep those eyes on the skies. <laughs>